So a lot of you probably know what Livology is, and that's why you came. Some of you might have just wandered in. Welcome. But for those of you who don't know what Livology is, Livology is a book that John Mark Comer wrote, and it's all about the theology of dating, marriage, relationships, and sex, and uh, God's heart beat for that, and, what, and just a guideline, pretty much, on how to live that part of your life in a godly way, in a way that honors Christ. Um, so John Mark is here tonight to share that, his, uh, all of his knowledge from his studies and that he did while putting together this book. And um, for those of you who don't know a lot about him, he is a pastor up, at, up in Portland at Bridgetown, which is an awesome church that's doing a, just a ton of great things for the Lord up there, and he is here tonight just to share his wisdom in his heart with us. So I'm going to stop talking and let someone a lot wiser start talking. So you can come on up, and we'll get this night kicked off. Thanks, dude. Sam, ladies and gentlemen, that was, what's your last name, Sam? Seno, and you are single? Let's change that tonight. How does that sound? If nothing else good happens tonight, let's take care of this boy, all right? <laughs> Fantastic. Hey, uh, how is everybody tonight? Good evening. Hi. You guys awake? You live? Yeah. Hey, so good to see all of you on a Thursday night. Well done for not getting drunk, and instead you're here to hopefully, you're like, wait, that's not what tonight's about? Nope, it's not. Sorry. And uh, hopefully you're here for Jesus, and even if you're not, we're just really happy you're here. Welcome. My name is John Mark. As Sam said, I lead a church in the west end of downtown Portland, just up the road, kind of, sort of, and I uh, live right in the urban core and love it. It's fantastic. Ride my bicycle everywhere in the rain. It's freezing and wet. It's actually not that cool, but it sounds cool. And uh, anybody here, this is actually my first time to hang out in Eugene. How crazy is that? Even though I'm not, I'm not far away. And uh, this is all I know of Eugene so far. So I had dinner beforehand with West Town and Joe from First Baptist. And I had, we had vegan food. Any fans in the house? Yeah. So this, what was it called? Pizza Research Institute. Lame name. Holy cow. Like, I'm a fan of, I'm a vegan kind of guy. But vegan pizza is basically like decaf coffee. It just sucks, you know? <laughs> But I had one heck of a vegan pizza. Actually, I had like way too much of it. So if I'm a little sluggish, let's blame it on the vegan pizza. But I'm, that's all I know of Eugene so far is like you guys and vegan pizza. So, so far, I love your city. Well, <laughs> well done. Um, anybody here from Portland? Yeah, a ton of you. We have students come down every year. Anybody here from Bridgetown Church or our family of churches up, up the road? Yeah, everybody's like, yeah, you're not, you're not, very, you're not proud at all. <laughs> You're like, yeah, we keep that on the DL. Sorry, you're an embarrassment. Anyway, well, wherever you come from, so happy that you are here. To start off, let's all stand together. And uh, before I start to talk, let's just pray to kind of frame this night for the first part of the evening. The first topic on deck is sexuality. Now, obviously, this is 2015, this is the West Coast. There really isn't a more volatile, incendiary, difficult, emotional, like, loaded subject matter than sexuality. Everybody, when it comes to sexuality, everybody has an opinion. And most of us, you, me, we all have an opinion that we feel deeply because your sexuality is, for better or worse, a part of your humanity. It's a part of who you are. And I get that. And I get that for a lot of you, sexuality is just this thing that you think about in the abstract and look forward to. For others of you, it's pain, it's, it's a haunting memory, it's from your childhood, from six months ago, from whatever. I get that we're all over the map. I also get that we're all over the map here tonight when it comes to Jesus. I'm guessing that the majority of you are followers of Jesus, and I'm also kind of guessing that some of you, I have no idea how many, are not followers of Jesus. You don't see yourself as an apprentice to Jesus of Nazareth. We just want you to know wherever you are at in that spectrum, we're really happy you're here. You're welcome, whether you believe um, in all the stuff that you're about to listen to or you think it is crazy. Either way, we're just really happy you're here. Even for those of you who are followers of Jesus, that's how you frame 
your way of life, you wake up in the morning and your goal is to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to become the kind of person who eventually in time will carry on all the beautiful kingdom work of Jesus of Nazareth. Even if that's you, my guess is we're still all over the map. Some of you are from the more conservative side of the spectrum, and your view of the Bible and out of that sexuality and marriage and gender is shaped in that way. Others of you are from the more progressive end, and you don't have the same way of thinking and feeling about the Bible, and because of that, your view of sexuality is very different. So wherever you come from, in a world of just volatile kind of, oh my gosh, just it's gnarly out there, just the Twitter sphere and the hate and the vitriol and that kind of a almost unrational, angry culture, can we just set aside a night wherever you come from with Jesus, with the Bible, and can we just open our heart and our mind to God? Hopefully we're all here with some kind of a bedrock that is God in the person of Jesus. Can we just open up all that we are and just ask God to have his way? So I just want to open by just a prayer that will be kind of straightforward. I just want to invite the Holy Spirit to come. So the Holy Spirit was Jesus' way of speaking about the empowering presence of God. So I just want to invite the empowering presence of God to come. You can close your eyes if you want. You can open. You can stare at the ceiling. You can stare down. Just don't stare at the cute girl in a couple rows in front of you. Just That's for later, all right? So there's a 10-minute break. That. Yeah, that's enough to succeed or fail, right? So for now, let's just open up all that we are to God. And, and this is something that we do at my church. Um, and if you don't want to do this, that's fine, no worries. But if you want, maybe just spread your hands out in front of you, just palms open. This is something we do. It's a symbolic gesture. It's just a way of saying to God, you're here, you're open, you're hungry, you're thirsty, whatever language you want, you're ready to receive from the Holy Spirit. And let's pray. God the Father, you made the world and everything in it. God the Son, Jesus, you saved the world and put it back on track. And God the Holy Spirit, you are with us. You are here and you are now. And we open up all that we are to you, our heart, our mind, our body, our past, our future, our present, our theology, our ethics, our decision-making, our will, our freedom, our slavery, our fear, our hope, our dreams, bitterness, our joy, our wounding, and our healing. We open up all that we are to you because you're good and you're safe and you're God. So here we are with you. And God, there's just, there's nobody like you. And it's so amazing to be with you as we talk about love and marriage and sex and romance and male and female It's all great, but God, you are greater, and life with you is the best. We thank you for that life. We invite you, come, have your way. Holy Spirit, come over this room, over this gym. God, I see a crowd, most of whom I don't know. You see every man, you see every woman. God, come, please. Set free, comfort, encourage, rebuke, enlighten, heal, breathe hope. Whatever every man and woman here needs, young or old, new to Jesus or well down the path, we invite you to come have your way. Thank you. Amen. All right, grab a seat. Okay, you ready? Nope. Well, let's pretend like you said yes. Uh, here we go. Hey, if you there we go. One of you, fantastic. But that was that was inauthentic. That's okay. Um, so, if you have a Bible, turn to Genesis chapter one. If you have an app on your phone, click on Genesis one. If you don't have an app on your phone, download one. Then put it on airplane mode, please. Yep, you're all like, that's not going to happen. Well, okay. 
Genesis chapter 1, and we have a ton of ground to cover. So on that note, let's jump right in. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We read this. In the beginning, finish the sentence with me, God created the heavens and the earth. In Hebrew, that phrase, the heavens and the earth, is a well-known idiom that basically means everything. It's kind of like from top to bottom in English. So in the beginning, God created everything. Now don't get off track here. Notice it does not say how long ago. Was this a couple thousands years ago, a couple million years ago, a couple billion years ago, more? And it does not say how, like was this through evolution or was it all in a moment? It doesn't say. It just says, in the beginning, God created everything. The point here is that the world that you and I call home, the body that you and I inhabit, it has a creator, it has a design, it has intention. Whether you're an artist or a designer or an engineer or an architect or a fashion worker, whatever, any kind of a creator, when you make something, you have an end in mind. And God is no different. When he made the world, when he made the human body, when he made you and me, he had an end in mind. In the beginning, God created everything. Now, we don't have time to read the entire story, so skip down to the end, to verse 31. The end of kind of this beautiful, ancient, primeval story, we read this. God saw all that he had made, and it was very, what? Good. Now, that word good in Hebrew is tov. Can you say tov? Well done. And it has to do, this word tov, with the human senses. Taste, touch, sight, sound, smell. In the scriptures, tov is used for bread, wine, honey, lotion, perfume, fruit, a feast, a home, shade on a hot Middle Eastern day. It can be translated lovely or beautiful. God saw all that he had made and it was very lovely. It was very beautiful beautiful. So the taste, for example, of fresh, well-made vegan pizza in your mouth, trust me, it's tove, right, Joe? You are not at all vegan, and it was great. Yeah, God made everything, and it was good. The smell of the ocean when you're at the beach on your little Instagram trip or whatever it is that you do, (laughs) eight hours of driving for one awesome picture, whatever, that is tove. Not Instagram, it's not Tove, but the ocean, it's kind of lame, but cool. But the ocean is Tove. The sight of a work of art is Tove, and sex is Tove. God saw all that he had made, so everything in the created order, including the human body, and everything that you and I call sex, beauty, attraction, the desire of a man for a woman, touch, arousal, the feeling of skin on skin, even foreplay, the joy of a kiss on your mouth, and sex itself, all of it is tov. It's good, in fact, it's very good. And that is the starting place for any and every conversation about sexuality as followers of Jesus, as people who read and believe in the Bible. You know, this says a lot about sex, but it says even more about God. I think we have this bent, in particular if you grew up in the church, I'm not sure how many of you that is, but we have this idea, I think, this erroneous idea that God is kind of this old crotchety grouch who's mad at the world and just doesn't want you to have fun, right? So anything that sounds fun, he just says, let's call that sin, you know what I mean? Sex, that sounds fun, sin, nope, no good. Pot, mm, sin. So just anything that sounds fun, we're like, he just says no to. What a broken and warped view of God. Nothing could be further from the truth. The reality is that God, I would argue, is a God of pleasure. He was in the beginning right here, and over the millennia, nothing has changed. There's a line in the New Testament about how God, quote, richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Is that how you think about God? We need a theology of enjoyment, not just when we talk about sex, but when we talk about all of life. We need a Genesis-shaped world that starts here on page one, not on page three, that basically says this world was created by God. It, at its core, is very good. He enjoys it, 
And so should we as an act of worship and gratitude. Food and drink and nature and beauty and sex. We should enjoy it as an act of worship to God. Um, My wife and I got married. Uh, We were really young. And I know this is not a ton of your story. We'll talk about that later. That's fine. But I was a virgin and so was my wife. Um, on the night of our marriage, which made the honeymoon super awkward, but a ton of fun. (laughs) Let's just talk straight. Like, I was just not James Bond, you know. Um, Now, no, that's a whole other teaching. (laughs) Uh, So we go over to London, England on our honeymoon, and we're at this hotel right on Hyde Park, and the first night we walk across the park to the Royal Albert Theatre Hall, maybe you know that from... TV or whatever, and we see that uber-depressing opera, Romeo and Juliet, which is just romantic, but just horrible. And so we get to the really depressing part, and my wife leans over and says, hey, do you want to just go have sex? And the answer to that is just always yes. (laughs) Yes, always, yes. So we go back, and we make love, and I remember, it's my first, second, third time, I remember there, lying in bed, after it was all over, and just thinking to myself that this was all God's idea. God made this up, not Daniel Craig, not Hollywood, not Vogue, like this, all of this, everything that I, that was all God's idea. That all started in God's mind eye, mind's eye, and God's imagination. This is what God is like, and this is what life in God's world is. Is like, And this is what Tove does to you, whether it's sex or a good meal or whatever, a sight of beauty in nature. Tove makes you step back, breathe it all in, and well up with gratitude and worship to a God who is honest to God that good. Rewind just a paragraph or two to verse chapter 1, verse 27, and we read this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and he said this, listen, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. By the way, that is the very first command in all of the Bible. Be fruitful and increase in number. Now, it's strange language. We don't talk that way about sex anymore because of birth control and the way that sex is done in the modern world. We, you know, we say make love or have sex or whatever it is, but that's the idea here. Go have a wife or a husband and make love and make children. Like That's the first command in all of the Bible. People argue that the Bible is full of rules, and you know what? There's a little bit of truth in that. The first rule is to make love to your spouse a lot. So not all rules are bad. Like, Some are pretty dang fantastic, you know? But for too long, I think the church's message on sex has essentially been shrunk down to don't. Just don't. Don't mess around with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Don't look at porn. Don't masturbate. Don't sleep together before you get married. Don't move in together. Don't, 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 don't. And in all honesty, I think that most of that is true. The problem is that the scriptures don't start with a negative command about sex. Don't. No, actually, the scriptures start with a positive command. Be fruitful and increase in number. One of the first things that we read about Adam and Eve is that they were, quote, both naked and they felt no shame. Can you imagine sex and relationship, intimacy with another man or woman, no guilt, no shame, no angst, Nothing but pure, innocent delight between a man and a woman in a relationship for life until death do us part. That was what God created and said, that is Tov. And notice that all of this is before the fall. You could put it this way. We were sexual before we were sinful. So what does that mean? We were sexual before we were sinful. That means that sex is not an evil curse that you and I have to, you know, curb or deny or say no to. It's the starting place is, no, sex is a good gift that you and I need to enjoy as long as it's in the right context. We'll talk more about that later, marriage. But this is a beautiful thing. 
Now, sadly, we don't live in the Garden of Eden anymore, right? So we're not, thankfully, naked and unashamed, unless if, like, you're in the privacy of your own home, and then that's weird, but okay. (laughs) And we are sinful now, and so what does all of that mean? Well, still, sex is a beautiful thing. Turn over to the Song of Songs. This is in the middle of your Bible. It's about halfway through. If you get to the book of Psalms, keep going, Proverbs, and then you get to the Song of Songs, and turn to chapter 4. So, If you're new to the Bible, you're about to love the Bible. Um, This book is at the tail end of the Hebrew wisdom literature, right after Proverbs, before the prophet Isaiah. And it's actually not a book per se. It's an ancient collection of erotic Jewish love poetry. And it's in the Bible. Come on. Orthodox Jewish men are not allowed to read this book until the age of 30. So hopefully you're not an Orthodox Jewish guy. If so, (laughs) sorry. All right? Take it up with your rabbi. So... For a long time, followers of Jesus in particular in the West have been like really upset by this book and like bending over backwards to turn the song into an allegory of some kind. Because basically the idea of a racy love poem that sounds more like Beyonce and Jay-Z than Paul, it just doesn't sit well with a lot of church, religious, Christian-y type of people. And so people want to make this into an allegory, where lips don't really mean lips, and breasts don't really mean breasts, and sex doesn't really mean sex. It's about intimacy with Jesus. I'm like, really? That's weird. (laughs) I mean, I love Jesus, but not in that way, like, at all, you know? That's just weird. I'm sorry. So, don't have time to get into all of that. (laughs) I remember years ago, I was at this uber-conservative church, and this good guy, preface, he was a good guy was up teaching through the Song of Songs as an allegory. And I remember at one point he goes, the right breast symbolizes the Old Testament and the left breast symbolizes the new and in between is the cross. <laughs> just like, just could not stop showering for days <laughs> after. Like, it's just my past, uh, no, no, no. First off, that's just gross. Secondly, I think that when he writes about her breasts, he just means he likes her breasts. I think that's enough. So, with all due respect, I don't think this is an allegory. And if you do, that's fine. But I'm not going to read it that way. I read this as a celebration of love and marriage and sexuality and romance and the dance between a man and a woman and that journey from what's your name all the way up to man and wife. And I think it's God's celebration saying, yes, I made this. I'm a and let's put this in the scripture. It's that good, and it's that beautiful. And this is, no matter how you read it, a hyper-sexualized love poem. In fact, chapter four is actually a sex scene, so kind of the wedding scene is the end of chapter three, and then you get into chapter four, and it is the man in poetry writing about the woman's body as she is undressing from the top down. Let's read it. So fun because your parents aren't here, so I can do this. Chapter 4, <laughs> verse 1. He starts off with her face. How beautiful are you, my darling? Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Guys, just give that one a try. Like, <laughs> on the 10 minute break, you know, just. Worst case scenario, she's not into goats, you know? (laughs) And then he moves down. Your teeth, I love this one, are like a flock of sheep just shorn coming up from the washing. Each one has its twin. Not one of them is alone. Did you get that? This is the ancient Near East. There's there's no dentist. So if your woman has all her teeth, you are are loving life. (laughs) It's like you have all of your teeth. None of your teeth are alone. Yes! Like that's... That's this right here. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. And now he starts to move down her body. Your neck is like the Tower of David. You do CrossFit. Built (laughs) with courses of stone. On it hang a thousand shields. All of them shields of warriors. Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. And then... The language, well, you use your, don't use your imagination, but you'll get the idea. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there 
is no flaw in you. And yes, by the way, that means exactly what you think it might mean. Now, we laugh at this because this is ancient, weird, organic, earthy poetry. But it's actually beautiful because the poet is able to evoke highly sexual imagery without ever sounding crass. I mean, this is poetry and romance and love at its best. It's just so genius. And then he keeps going. We don't have time to read the whole thing, but skip down to 12, and he writes this. You, this is the man speaking to the woman, the husband to the wife on the wedding night. You are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. This is an ancient euphemism, a way of saying that she's a virgin. So a fountain was a euphemism for a woman's sexuality. Use your imagination there. And she's a sealed fountain, meaning she's not easy to get into. But she is anything but a prude. Keep reading. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates, your choice fruits with henna and nard, nard and saffron, all this stuff. Fifteen, you are a garden fountain, a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon. And listen to what the woman says in return. Awake, north wind. Come, south wind. Blow on my garden that its fragrance may spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. That is highly erotic sexual and visual, but it's not crass. It's poetic and beautiful. Now, read what happens next. This next part is absolutely insane. Chapter 5, verse 1. This is after intercourse is over. He writes this in the past tense. I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeymoon, my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. This is the couple lying in bed after it's over, just loving the pleasure of the moment. It's that incredible feeling that you get with the right kind of sex, with a man or a woman you're in relationship with for life. You feel release and calm and at peace. You feel close, safe, intimate, vulnerable. You feel naked and unashamed, and it is such a great feeling. But the story's not quite over. One more line I want to read. The next line says this, eat friends and drink, drink your fill of love. Now, who's talking there? In my Bible, I have an NIV translation. Above that stanza, it says friends. That word friends is not actually in the original Hebrew. That was put there by a translator to help you and I make sense of the poetry. But actually, scholars really debate that, whether or not the friends are the ones speaking, because Well, first off, I mean, no matter how close you are to your bridesmaid, that's just a little too close. Like, that's not a moment you want your bridesmaids at or whatever. So who is speaking here? Well, the majority, not all, but the majority of scholars argue that this is God speaking right here. That God is in the bedroom with this newlywed couple on the wedding night, in the moment of sex, that God is there. And God's word in that moment is eat, friends, and drink. Drink your fill of love. That is what God is like. Literally singing over two lovers on the wedding night. Is that how you think about God? Is that how you think about sex? That is what God is like. His view of sex is incredible. Even in a post-Eden world, even now that everything, sexuality, relationships, Your body, all of it has been warped by sin and corruption and rebellion and societal, systemic evil. All of it, even in this world gone awry, still God is singing over that good gift that he created all those years ago. From creation through the fall to the shattered world that you and I now call home, over all of that noise, God is still singing, eat, drink. It's good. In fact, it's very good. So... I basically have two major thoughts for you tonight about sex. Not hard to remember. And the first one is this. It's just that sex is good. And I know a lot of you are like, yeah, I'm aware of that. Thank you. Like, I don't need you to tell me that. But I know for a lot of you, in particular, if you grew up maybe in a conservative or religious home, or maybe if you have any abuse in your childhood, or maybe if you had a bad experience with sex early on, 
or maybe if you feel like you don't look like Angelina Jolie or Brad Pitt or whoever, and your body isn't something that you parade around in pride, or for whatever reason, I know for a lot of you, you actually don't have a positive view of sex. Sex is fear, sex is regret, sex is guilt, shame, apprehension, insecurity. It's a whole lot of things, but it's not toad. And I just want to start tonight by saying, listen, this is where the scriptures start. This is where God starts. This is page one, that your body, all of it, and your sexuality is good. Yes, warped by sin. Yes, the world we live in is a mess. Yes, every relationship is dysfunctional. We'll talk about that later. But at its core, sex is good. Now, I have one more thought. Turn back to Genesis one more time. So rewind again to chapter 2 this time. Genesis chapter 2. You awake out there, yeah? That was awesome. I said that. I see one dude yawn and three people are like, yeah. Never come back to Eugene. Um, I'm messing with you. Uh, you're like, I hope not. Genesis, moving on. Genesis chapter 2. Uh, skip down to verse 4. So in Genesis 1, there's, there's this beautiful creation story about the heavens and the earth and God creating everything. But then in chapter 2, it, it's very different. It's about God creating this man and this woman, this proto-man, this proto-female, the the seed of the human race. We read this in chapter four, or chapter two, verse four. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth. Man, he's making up for lost time in Oregon. And, and there was no one to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth, watered the whole surface of the ground. Then, listen to this, listen. The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now, the word man here in Hebrew is Adam, where we get the word or the name Adam. Any Adams in the house tonight? Ser Seriously, no? This many people? Yeah, one. Okay, well done. That was awesome. You stand apart. Awesome. So... That's where we get this idea, and there's a play on words in the original language. So Adam is made, or Adam is made from, in Hebrew, it's the Adama, or the ground in the English translation. Meaning, listen, so Adam is made from the Adama. Meaning, there is a symbiotic relationship between human and the earth. At first, human is nothing more than a corpse, but then we read that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became something more. He became a, quote, living being. So human beings, and here's where I will break from a number of your professors at school, human beings have no parallel in the universe. Animals, for example, are pure physicality. They don't have what you and I call a soul. So they eat, but they don't set a table. They, they speak in a rudimentary language, kind of, but they don't write poetry. They think, but they don't come up with philosophy. Now, angels, on the other hand, are made of pure spirit. So they, if you read the scriptures, they manifest physicality from time to time, but they are made out of spirit. They inhabit a world that's not made out of flesh and bone and concrete and earth and glass. But Adam, or human, is a hybrid. You are a hybrid, and so am I. We are made from the dust. Adam in the story is made from raw, uncut, atomic matter. So he has physicality, but then we read that God breathed into his nostrils, so he has a spirit. He is an integrated, holistic being. You and I are an integrated, holistic being. What does this mean? Well, when it comes to sex, it means that you and I don't have a body. You are a body. Let me say that again because of the after effect of Plato's teachings, dualism, Western Greek philosophy, and its infiltration of the church for millennia now. You don't have a body. You are a body body, your soul, your spirit, and your skeleton, and your nervous system, your skin, your sex organs, your mind, your memory banks, your smile, your personality, it's all you. There's this insidious idea right now that, you know, the real you is on the inside. We hear this all the time. 
The real you isn't your body. The real, the real you is on the inside. And your body is just this shell to carry you around. And I think in part it's because our body is so, obs- our culture is so obsessed with body image that it breeds insecurity because most of us don't look anything like the penalty of, you know, beauty and sex goddess or guy or like, we just don't look like what we see in the media every single day, every single hour, every single minute. So we overreact. And I hear on a regular basis, people say things like, you know, you need to love me for me, not for my body. And I get, I get that for sure. Like, especially in a sexualized, superficial culture. Yeah, yes. But your body's a part of who you are. So that's kind of like me saying, hey, you need to love me for me, not for my personality. You say, well, okay, but unfortunately, your personality is a part of who you are. Sorry, but it, like, there's no escaping. Exactly. Because body, soul, spirit, personality, eye color, it's all you. And by the way, it's all very good. Now, all of this has profound implications for Adam and Eve's sexuality. Skip down to the end of the chapter. So in the story, Eve is created from Adam's rib. And don't get hung up on that. Are we reading poetry? Are we reading narrative? Is this literal? Is this symbolic? Like, frankly, it doesn't really matter. The point is that Eve is human, just like Adam. She's made from Adam's side. And we read this at the end. In chapter 2, verse 23, we read, The man said... This is now, by the way, this is poetry. The first man is quoting poetry. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Guys, if it's intimidating to you that the first man was a poet, don't worry, he's not a very good poet. It's like, what should, she shall be called, what am I called, man? Woman. Like, yep, we get better with time. So, She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why, listen, listen. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and listen, they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now, this this next part is so cool. This word one right here is echad in Hebrew. Can you say that? Yeah, perfect. Well, you say it kind of like a Klingon, you know, like, 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 yeah, why don't you just spit on the girl in front of you? That's how you say it. So it's don't, actually, by the way. It's a graphic, weighty word. In fact, this exact same word is used for God later in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy, there's this famous prayer called the Great Shema. Actually, it's called the Shema, but the Great <laughs> Shema. And it's that, you know, maybe you know this line. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind with all your strength, for the Lord your God is Echad, or he is one. Now, when you combine this word Echad, or one, with this word flesh, basically it means fused together at the deepest level. So, Deuteronomy 6, the great Shema, God himself is fused together at the deepest level as we think about father and son and spirit. And when a man or a woman and a woman make love, we catch a glimpse, a hint, a pale shadow of that kind of oneness. Echad is when the lines blur between a man and a woman. Echad is when you are wrapped up so close with another human being that you're not really sure who's who anymore. Echad is when you know and you are known. Later in the Genesis story, we read that Adam, quote, knew his wife and she became pregnant. To know is another Hebrew idiom for sex. And it's fitting because when you make love to somebody, you know them at the deepest level in a way that nobody else does. So here's my second thought. First thought, sex is good. Second thought is yes and sex is also powerful. You need to get that. In sex, two separate, autonomous human beings become one flesh or one entity. Two people are fused together at the deepest levels. They know each other and they are known by each other. And this action cannot be undone. 
it is irreversible and immutable. And to God and his paradigm, the only relationship that is strong enough to hold that kind of untamed, fierce power is marriage. The only container that can handle that kind of nuclear force that we call sex is a man and a woman locked in covenant relationship for life until death do us part, no matter what you look like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, in sickness or in chronic illness. I was with a man earlier tonight whose wife is in chronic illness and he is faithful to his bride. That is the only kind of relationship that is strong enough to handle the raw, uncut power of what happens in sex, when two separate autonomous human beings become one flesh. Which means what? Which means that we need to actually take sex way more seriously than most people do in and outside of the church. Turn over to the New Testament with me, and now let's kind of turn all the way to the right. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So if you're new to the Bible, you kind of go to Matthew, Mark, John, and then you get into a bunch of letters. And just go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This language, and just stay with me for a little bit longer. This language of ekhad is reused by Paul much later here in this letter in the New Testament. Now, really fast, just a little bit of background on Corinth because it's something of a legend. So Corinth was, you know, I don't know, the Las Vegas or L.A. or Portland or New York or whatever of the ancient world. It was just hyper aggressive, liberal, whatever you want to call it, hyper-sexualized. It was kind of like, you know, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. That was kind of the philosophy. The city was built on a thin isthmus and in between the Aegean and the Adriatic Seas. And so sailors would usually dock in the harbor right there in Corinth and walk. It was only a four and a half mile stint to the other side. And so thousands of sailors and merchants and travelers made Corinth a hub for prostitution. In uh, Paul's day, Corinthian was actually slang for a prostitute. Like, ooh, careful, she's a Corinthian. Can you imagine, like, she's a Eugener. What, Eugene, she's from Eugene, I don't know, whatever you call people here. Eugeners, no? Eugenians, as if that's cooler, yeah. <laughs> that's so much, you, she's like, no, Eugenians. I'm like, that's great, like, you with the Vulcans, um, great. So anyway, this, I mean, this was the world uh, of Corinth. So it's a culture of rampant, open, progressive, hypersexualization, a lot like a Eugene, a lot like a Portland, a lot like a city that you and I call home. Now, let's start off, chapter 6, verse 9. Keep, stay with me. Paul writes this, Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? These are people who on a regular basis do wrong. He goes on to qualify that in a minute. Do not be deceived. There's a ton of people, particular in a city like this, campus like this, there's a ton of people who are deceived. And Paul's like, listen, don't be deceived. Don't buy the lie. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what, I love this line, some of you were. Not are, but were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, or the King of the world, and by the Spirit of our God. That is epic writing right there. That is so beautiful. Now, keep reading. He goes on. I have the right to do anything you say. Notice that line right there in 12. I have the right to do anything. If you have the NIV, it's in quotes. So in context, in this part of the letter... Paul is fielding questions from the church in Corinth. This is like the ancient first century version of a Q&A. Like you don't text in your question, you send a messenger with a parchment, okay? And then a year later, you get an answer. So this is a Q&A, all right? So this is the question. And right now, at this point in the letter, all of the questions are about sex. So this line here is a quote, meaning Paul is not saying this. The Corinthians are saying this. The Corinthians are saying, hey, I have the right to do anything, you say. But listen to Paul's answer. Yes, but not everything is beneficial, meaning not everything is good for you. He goes on, I have the right to do anything. There it is again, in quotes. That's what the Corinthians are saying. But, Paul writes, yes, but I will not be mastered 
by anything. I mean, I will not be brought under the control of anything. Can't you see, Paul's writing, that you are under the control of an addiction to sex? And then we read this. You say, food for the stomach. This is what the Corinthians are saying. People in the day are saying. You say, food for the stomach, the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. Okay, stay with me. A little bit more background on Corinth. So Corinth was 50 miles south of Athens, home to Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, all the great Greek philosophers. Athens was the birthplace of dualism. So this idea of a spiritual world and a physical world was kind of the norm in this part of the ancient Mediterranean. I mean, Plato flat out said that your body, and he was wrong, according to Jesus, but he said that your body is the, quote, prison house of the soul. So here's the deal. Because of that, people in Athens and Corinth and the first century Greco-Mediterranean world were saying, listen, it doesn't matter what you do with your body because it's just physical. That's all it is. What's the big deal? It doesn't matter. And this line of thinking made its way into the church. The Corinthians started thinking about sex. Hey, it's just physical. I have a stomach, and when I get hungry, I eat. When I get thirsty, I drink. When I get tired, I sleep. I have sex organs. When I get horny, I have sex with my girlfriend, with my boyfriend, with my fiance, with a prostitute, whatever. What's the big deal? It's just physical. Does that sound familiar? It's how most people, at least in my city, who are not followers of Jesus, and a lot who are, think about sex. But listen to what Paul says next, second half of 13. He writes this. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, this phrase, sexual immorality, is one word in Greek, porneia, where we get the word pornography. Long story short, it means any and all sexual activity outside of marriage between a man and a woman in relationship for life. So it's a junk drawer word. It's semantic range. It's really broad. It's everything from sleeping with your boyfriend or girlfriend to friends with benefits, casual sex, oral sex, Netflix and chill, adultery, <laughs> prostitution, porn, like raunchy stuff on TV, strip clubs, like prostitution. It's all of that. It's all porneia. It's all sexual immorality. It's all a cheap parody of what God created and called good in the garden. And Paul says, listen, your body, your body is a part of who you are. Paul's not a dualist, okay? Your body, he writes, was meant for the Lord and vice versa. The Lord was meant for your body, meaning you were created to know God in your body. Your relationship with God does not take place in a spiritual world someplace else. It happens right here. In this world, in this city, in this body, that's where you relate to God. Therefore, what you do with your body matters. He goes on to say this in 14. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. He's saying, listen, your body is going to come back. You're going to live forever with Jesus in a body. Do you not know that your bodies are members of the Messiah himself? Shall I then take the members of the Messiah and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Like, are you out of your mind? Don't you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is, listen, one with her in body? For it is said, and here it comes, a quote of Genesis 2. The two will become achad, or one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one spirit with him. Wow. So people are going to prostitutes, having sex right and left all over this progressive, sexualized city, thinking, hey, what's the big deal? It's just physical. And here we are, millennia later, that mindset is alive and well. I mean, how many people, your friend, your roommate, your professor, your mom, your dad, you, just think that way? Hey, it's, like, it's just sex. It's just like play for grown-ups. That's all it is. It's just biological coupling for sexual release. What's the big deal? It's just porn. It's just a picture. It's just an image. I look. I don't touch. What's the big deal? Paul says, no, actually, don't you get it? Sex is about so much more than sex. You need to understand that tonight, if nothing else. Sex is about two, it's when two people become one. Now listen, listen. 
This means that God's view of sex is actually much higher than culture at large. It's easy to miss that with all of the negative rhetoric about sex, especially in the church, and especially if you grew up in, not to stereotype, but a more conservative church. It's easy to miss that. But it's true. Culture basically says, hey, sex is just biological. It is just the momentary coupling of two bodies for sexual release. It's just play for grown-up people. It's just recreation. That's all it is. And God says, hold, are you out of your mind? No way. It is so much more. I would know. I made it. I thought it up. It was my idea. I set it into motion. I had an end in mind. I had a design. I had an intention. And it is so much more. It is when two separate human beings are fused into one. It is the fusing of two whole people, body and soul, into one entity. And then that refusing over and over again, deepening your intimacy through the pleasure and joy and challenge and delight of sex. It is physical and it is spiritual because there is no way to tear the two apart. It's one of the major mistakes that we've made in the church over the last couple of uh, decades is we bought into culture's definition of sex. My short answer is culture says that sex is just play for grown-ups. We bought into that, and then we would said, yeah, but you can only do that if you're married. And oh, by the way, only between a man and a woman. Heterosexual, that's all. And everybody around you says, are you out of your freaking mind? Even if you grew up in the church, even if you believe in the Bible and you follow Jesus, if you're a thinking, intelligent person, and that's your definition of sex, and then you hear, well, it's only for marriage, and only between a man and a woman. But we love, it doesn't matter. Like, that's nonsensical. It's just, it's not an intelligent, doesn't make any sense. So before we talk as followers of Jesus in the church about where you should and should not have sex, that's a legitimate conversation, but first, we have to talk about what sex is. Yes, it's play for grown-ups. Sure, it's a ton of fun. It's very good. It's tov. But it's also powerful. In sex, two people become one flesh. That's why there's no such thing as casual sex. Urban myth doesn't exist. Because when you make love to somebody, whether you have known them for years or minutes, something powerful happens. That's why a lot of the time, couples that sleep together when they are dating, know they shouldn't or maybe don't, whatever, often have a really hard time breaking up, even when people all around them, family, friends, are saying, like, you guys are not a good match. Seriously, what are you thinking? Like, he's fine and you're okay, but like, that's just not a good... You're not a good combo. Usually, it's because they're sleeping together. And a relationship that should have lasted a couple of weeks or a couple of months and ended in a magnanimous, healthy, mature parting of ways instead lasts a couple of years and ends in heartache and shame and regret and lost time. Because when you make love to another person, man, you give away a part of who you are. In marriage, this is beautiful. If you're locked in relationship with one person for life, oh my gosh, sex is like, it's just like gravity. It keeps you in orbit with each other. Later on in the next chapter, Paul commands married couples to have sex a lot. There's a command like that in the Bible? Yes. You're like, can I memorize it? Sure, go ahead. You're single. It's weird, but okay. For later. Save it for later. Like he commands it. It's that important, very important. But outside of marriage, this is destructive. What does it do? It turns another human being into an object for self-gratification, for narcissism. What most people in our culture mean by love is actually lust. Lust is I want this thing, experience, person to make me happy. When most people say, I love you, what they actually mean is when I'm around you, I feel happy and I want to have sex with you. That's not love. That's lust. Now, it's not wrong to want to have sex with somebody. That's a very different vantage point than I love you. I want to give my life for you until my last breath. It's a totally 
other framework. This is why Paul's closing line, we're almost done in 18, is this. Flee or run away from sexual immorality. Or put, put another way, just run for your life. Like all the other sins, he goes on to write, a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. You hurt yourself. You hurt your sexuality. You hurt your humanity. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. And it's such a fascinating way to put it. You sin against your own body. Meaning when you step outside of God's relational framework for sex, this context called marriage that, he, that God himself created for you to enjoy and express your sexuality is, you hurt yourself more than anybody. Now, um, I have no idea where you're at right now. I know that we barely know each other, and this, that was heavy. I get that. Some of you are fine, and you're great, and you can't wait to have sex someday. Others of you are just, man, like angry, hurt, upset. Your soul is bleeding right now. Maybe you disagree. Maybe you don't disagree at all. You're like, yes, that is my story, and you just have all this regret, heartache, what was I thinking? Damage, maybe? Listen, here's the good news. Sex is good, and sex is powerful, but God is even better, and God is even more powerful. No matter how wrecked your sexuality is, and hopefully it's not, but no matter how wrecked it is, Jesus was in the business of healing sick people. That's what he did, and that's what he does. Jesus heals people. My church is um, 70% single. Uh, we live right in the city, and it's really young and all that. So I just get front row seats to watch all of this unfold, the good and the bad of marriage and sexuality and romance. I see a lot of joy, and I see a lot of heartache. But I get front row seats to see Jesus heal people right and left. Not that long ago, there was a guy who was coming out of alcohol addiction, was new to our church, and he just started following Jesus. And one night, he's at church, we're singing, and he looks across the room, and he sees a prostitute that he paid money for three months before. And as you can imagine, he's just wrecked, you know, like you're at church. So after church, and I was so proud of the guy, he goes up to her, and he says, I am so sorry. Will you please forgive me? That, that has Jesus written all over it. And that story is dramatic and it's intense and all that. Most of our lives are not that dramatic. But the reality is that Jesus heals people. He takes wounds and he turns them into scars. Right? Think about the difference, you know. A wound, um, whether it's self-inflicted or from somebody else, when you touch it, hurts, and it bleeds. It's in danger of infection. But a scar, like it's there, but when you touch it, um, there's no more pain. There's a mark that never really goes away. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller over time, depending on how big it was. But the pain is gone, and scars can actually be used for good. Scars tell a story. Like, I have a couple on my body. Each one has a story of, like, don't do that. Scars tell a story not only of mistakes made, but of healing. And so all of us have wounds that Jesus, on a regular basis, turns into scars. So I don't know where you're at tonight. Maybe you have a wound. Maybe it's open. It's bleeding. It's painful. It's festering. Maybe you have scars, but you're thinking, now look what God has done in my life. Look at the healing here. And it's only been a year. Can you imagine what God will do in your life? love to watch the redemption of human sexuality as people follow Jesus together into marriage. and It's so beautiful. And my guess is that a number of you are somewhere in between. And so I just want to end with Paul's last paragraph. I love that line. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your what? Body. It's the closing line. I love this metaphor. In the ancient Near East, as I said, um, Corinth was a hub for sex trafficking all over the Roman Empire. So there was a slave market, 
right in the middle of the city. If you wanted, you could go down, and there was a woman, half naked, standing on a block for sale. And you could buy her, you could take her home, you could rape her, you could use her, abuse her, or if you wanted, go down to that exact same slave market. You could see a half naked, cold, wrecked slave girl. You could buy her, you could set her free. And you could invite her to be your wife. You could love her and care for her until death do us part. That is the imagery of God. Our God is the God who goes down to the slave market and says, you, yes, you, you're free. I'm here. I love you. Let me put you back together calls that shattered human being, you are my bride. And he makes her into something beautiful. That's what we are like. And even more importantly, that's what God is like. And this is true for all of you. I feel like some of you are thinking, yeah, for her, for him, for them, not for me but you don't know my story, but I knew better, but I was so young, but the damage is irreversible, but he doesn't love me, but I will never be whole again, but this, that, the other. Listen, this is for all of you. No matter who you are or where you come from, whether you're a follower of Jesus yet or not, you are loved. And what defines you as a follower of Jesus is not your past, it's not even your present, it's your future. It's not who you've been, it's not what you've done or have not done, what has been done to you or not done to you. It's who you are becoming in Jesus, lavish, opulent love. That is who you are. You are loved. Believe that. That is the truth of the gospel of Jesus. Let's all stand and pray. God, um, I know this is a heavy moment, not for everybody, but for a number of people, and we just want to respect that. I know the rest of the night is upbeat, and hopefully we will have a ton of fun and laugh and learn. But right now, God, in this moment, we just need you, and we need your healing touch. comfort, we need your freedom, your salvation. If that's you and you just need the comfort and the healing love of God over your sexuality or over your life in general, whether it's emotionally or relationally from your past or childhood, a relationship, trauma, mistakes, whatever, shame, guilt, really get the sense there's shame and guilt in the room tonight. If that's you, I just want you to take a moment right where you're at There's no like mood lighting or band or anything. I just want you right where you're at in this quiet moment just to ask God, just open up your life to Jesus. He's a gentleman. He will not force himself on you. Just tell him that you want his love. You want his comfort, his healing. Guys, forgive the analogy, but you want his marriage. Just tell him that now. Let the love and acceptance and healing of Jesus come over your life through the Holy Spirit. And God, now our great hope as we move forward into the future is redemption. You are God of redemption. You take all the good, all the bad, all the ugly and in between. You take success and failure, what's happened, what's not happened, and you turn it into good. And so we just open up our life to you and pray for you to do your thing. Redeem your sons and your daughters. Redeem your bride. Reshape, terraform, change, renew, fix, bless your people, we pray. Amen.
Amen. Awesome. Hey, thanks. I know that was long and heavy. Everything else is shorter than not heavy. I promise. I promise. Okay, it is 840. You have 10 minutes to flirt. I mean, go to the bathroom or whatever. 10 minutes, and then we're back here, going to chat about dating. 10 minutes. Have fun.